Hello and welcome to another episode of Peace at Last, a podcast that discusses the latest scientific discoveries in psychology, explains techniques and principles from ancient spiritual traditions, and gives you the mental technology to put them into practice. You can change the way you feel and find peace at last. My name is Fabrice Nye, psychologist, coach, and spiritual explorer. If this podcast speaks to you, you may subscribe on the platform of your choice. I also invite you to share your favorite episode with some of your friends. Word of mouth is the best way to spread the word and support the podcast. I am back after a summer break and honeymoon in the national parks of Utah. It felt good to get away from the smoky skies of California for a few weeks during the fire season. So I'm continuing today with a series about those three short, one-syllable words that we use all the time, but that have the potential to create misery, anxiety, and depression. In the last episode, we talked about the word should. The word today is need. But first, I'd like to thank Samer, who left a comment on the peaceatlast.us website. He writes, Hello, Dr. Nye, or Fabrice, as I know you in the Feeling Good podcast. I haven't finished listening yet to all the episodes of your new podcast. I'm just writing you to say that I always liked your dialogue with Dr. Burns. You were enriching them definitely a lot. I'm listening now to your own podcast. I want to wish you all success. Thank you, Samer, for your endorsement. Know that part of my goal is to build an archive with targeted episodes for you to go back to when you want a refresher on a particular topic, like the one on which you left this comment, how emotions are constructed. Today's topic is about the word need. I think that looking first at the definition may be valuable. The Merriam-Webster dictionary defines it as one, a lack of something requisite, desirable or useful, two, a physiological or psychological requirement for the well-being of an organism, or three, a condition requiring supply or relief. So we find that the word is related to a lack and to a requirement. When you go down the rabbit hole of synonyms and associated words, you start seeing words like compulsory, inevitable, inescapable, necessary, indispensable, essential, compelled, demand, claim. Can you already feel the sense of pressure that gets handed down with such words? This has to do with why the word can lead to some difficult emotions. Anyone who has taken introductory psychology classes has heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It is often represented as a pyramid, kind of like the food pyramid, with the most basic needs at the bottom, physiological, safety, love, and the higher needs at the top, esteem and self-actualization. Abraham Maslow wrote a paper in 1943 called A Theory of Human Motivation. In it, he writes that man is a perpetually wanting animal. So the so-called needs are organized in hierarchies of urgency, or what Maslow calls a prepotency, where the appearance of one need usually rests on the prior satisfaction of another, a more urgent need. Even though we have retained from that paper the notion of hierarchy of needs, what he really wanted to formulate was a theory of human motivation. In his paper, he uses the terms needs, desires, wants, and motivation almost interchangeably. But we seem to have only remembered the term needs from his theory. Maslow writes that sickness results from any of our basic needs being thwarted. And then later in the 80s, psychology's researcher Edward D.C. and Richard Ryan worked on a theory of non-physiological needs. They propose that we have three fundamental psychological needs. Autonomy, the desire to be in control of our lives. Competence, feeling capable in our interactions with the world. And relatedness, connecting with others and experiencing a sense of caring. But this theory of psychological needs 
was intended to build a larger theory of human motivation that they called self-determination theory. So like Maslow, they were interested in needs in order to understand motivation. So even though in all those theories the word need is used, I haven't seen a discussion of the appropriateness of the use of this word. In the minds of those famous psychologists, those things they call needs were absolute requirements. It was taken for granted that such a thing as a need existed and was real. So to provide a different perspective, I would like to read an excerpt of Byron Katie's book, Loving What Is. She takes a wholly different approach to what is and what isn't required. I was in the delivery room when my grandson Racy was born. I loved him at first sight. Then I realized that he wasn't breathing. The doctor had a troubled look on his face and immediately started to do something with the baby. The nurses realized that the procedures weren't working and you could see panic began to take over the room. Nothing they did was working. The baby wouldn't breathe. At a certain moment, Roxanne looked into my eyes and I smiled. She later told me, You know that smile you often have on your face, Mom? When I saw you look at me like that, a wave of peace came over me. And even though the baby wasn't breathing, it was okay with me. Soon afterward, breath entered my grandson and I heard him cry. I love that my grandson didn't have to breathe for me to love him. Whose business was his breathing, not mine? I wasn't going to miss one moment with him, whether he was breathing or not. I knew that even without a single breath, he had lived a full life. I love reality, not the way a fantasy would dictate, but just the way it is right now. 99% of people will tell you that breathing is an absolute need. In fact, As you are listening to this, you may be wondering yourself what I'm driving at. Perhaps it is a foregone conclusion for you. Do I need to breathe? Well, in the absolute, no. This is what Katie is pointing to. The rationale is similar to the last episode about should statements. If the universe works in an orderly, lawful fashion, the way I know what I need is by looking at what I have in this moment. I may prefer it to be different, but it is what it is. It is true that the word need can be used relative to a particular purpose or goal. If my goal is to purchase a house, then I need money in order to fulfill that goal. If I want to drive my car to a destination, then I need gas in order to get there. And back to the earlier example, I need to breathe in order to live at least beyond the next five minutes. Did you notice that in all the examples I just cited, the need is always in context, always relative. In each case, I use the key phrase, in order to, because when we set a goal for ourselves, the goal itself is not an absolute need either. Do I need to buy a house? Do I need to drive my car to that destination? And do I even need to stay alive? Those are not absolutes. And it is on the usage in an absolute sense of the word need that I would like to focus here. Because if you haven't already gathered from the previous episodes, a big part of what causes us problems is simply the way we talk to ourselves. When I use the word need in my thoughts or in spoken language, it evokes in me a sense of craving something, aching for something, yearning for something, lusting after something or someone, a sense of hunger or thirst. In the second of the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha identified this thirst. He used the old Pali word tanha. He said that this thirst was a principal source of suffering. Thirst in this context is not some healthy kind of desire, but an unhealthy kind that feels compulsive or driven, 
And that Buddhist notion is usually translated in English by the word craving. Craving for food, drugs, entertainment, possessions, love and approval, power, fame, mental stimulation, etc. This craving causes us to suffer, but that doesn't mean that all desire is unhealthy. A desire for someone to be happy, for my body to be healthy and well-nourished, or simply for taking the next breath would be quite wholesome. In fact, Buddhism has a word for that kind of desire, chanda. It is that subtle distinction that leads to a not-so-subtle difference in the way we feel. Can you hear the difference in tone between phrases like I need versus I would like or I prefer or even I want? I need implies that I must have something or someone or else the universe simply is not in its right place or else I'm going to be crushed or else something terrible is going to happen. Earlier when I typed the words I need to into the Google search engine, among the sentence auto-completion that it usually offers, what popped up was, I need to lose weight. <laughs> Have you ever said that to yourself? Do you perceive the sense of desperation that is implied in that sentence? Now try saying instead the sentence, it would be nice to lose weight. How does that feel instead? What if I turn what I believe to be a need into a preference? To go back to the theories of motivation of Maslow or DC and Ryan, the sense of craving, of thirst, of I must have this, has probably been very useful in our evolution to motivate us to reach for the next food source, the next shelter, the next mate, the next leader position, the next job, the next new car, and on and on and on. But if that motivation has been valuable for survival, it has wreaked havoc in our emotional lives. Now, for the most part, in the 21st century, our basic survival requirements are met. Now that we have ensured our supply of food and shelter, now that we won't be prey to the saber-toothed tigers or lions and bears, now that we don't have to defend every night our children from the attacks of a neighboring tribe, and especially now that if I do not pass my genes on to the next generation, it will not signify the end of the human species. We can step off this evolutionary treadmill and focus less on survival and more on finding peace and happiness. What if our motivation came not from a sense of lack, but from a sense of expansion, growth, flourishing, enlightenment? What if we started from a place where we see the world to be exactly as it needs to be now and let ourselves follow our bliss, our inspirations, or our aspirations. As in this quote attributed to Zen master Suzuki Roshi, each of you is perfect the way you are, and you can use a little improvement. This means that the place where we are now is not lacking anything. In other words, we have everything we need, and everything else that comes our way is just pure joy added on to perfection. So let's see, what do we do when we catch ourselves using the words, I need? Well, there's a technique called rephrasing or the semantic method. And you will notice that this method is the same one I recommended in the last episode to undo the negative effects of the word should. That's because what the phrases I need and I should have in common is that they're both rubbish. They're simply at odds with the way the universe works. So when you hear yourself say, I need to lose 20 pounds, try rephrasing it into, I would probably feel healthier if I weighed 20 pounds less. If you hear your inner voice say, I need him to respect me, lower your blood pressure and say to yourself instead, I would prefer it if he spoke to me in a kinder tone. Then you can feel freer to notice your preferences and decide whether you want to act on them or not without any sense of pressure or compulsion now that you have removed the word need from your inner dialogue. 
Now, keep in mind that I am not suggesting you entirely eradicate the word need from your vocabulary, just like the word should. They still have their place when you want to make a point or use a shortcut. But remind yourself, as you use them, they do not describe reality. And remember that this notion of need is not a requirement in order to act. You don't need to need in order to do. This concludes this episode of Peace at Last. For more information, go to peaceatlast.us, where you'll find the show notes for this episode. If you have comments or questions, leave them on the website, or you can email me directly at fabrice at life.net. I may be selecting your question as a topic for a future episode. I also invite you to contact me if you'd like some personalized help in applying the principles I describe here. If you just discovered this podcast, I'm inviting you to subscribe on iTunes or on the platform of your choice. If you like it and you want to support it, tell a friend who may not be familiar with podcasting and show them how to subscribe. And I also invite you to go to iTunes and leave a review. It will help other people discover this podcast. I am Dr. Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join me next time for another episode of Peace at Last. <music>